This is Twit. It turns out that technology just keeps on improving, just keeps on keeping on. And uh, something that's right around the corner that is seemingly going to be a big deal is the next iteration of ChatGPT joining us to talk about OpenAI, ChatGPT, and what happens next is Semaphore's own Reed Albergati. Welcome back to the show, Reed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hell's Plant's healthy. I've been watering it, so we're all good. Um, good, good. <laughs> good to get you back on the show. So um, this is, you know, an ongoing conversation uh, as we've been obviously seeing chat GPT up to this point. But one of the big things um, that you uh, kind of got the scoop on over at Semaphore is the next iteration of GPT. And I have to tell you, I was a little embarrassed uh, as I was reading through this. I thought, OK, so I've, I've learned large language models. I've learned all these terms. I never thought to look up what GPT stood for for some reason. So I was hoping you could start by talking about the next iteration of GPT, what GPT stands for, and kind of give us the basics before we dig in. Yeah. Okay. So first, but you know, taking a step back, um, you know, I've been following the, the sort of trajectory of this, talking to people who've used, um, you know, various iterations of this or have been working on training uh you know open ai products uh it is i think they are going to get much much better and i think this this product release is is pretty exciting um we gpt3 is what powers chat gpt which is the big craze you know everybody's using it um and the gpt4 i think is coming out very soon um there's going to be a mobile app um it's going to be much more detailed it's going to sound much more human-like um, and and OpenAI, the company that owns uh, ChatGPT, has been hiring all of these. We broke this story last week. They've been hiring uh, a lot of contractors, including computer programmers, to try and actually teach this thing how to write code. Um, so it's expanding its capabilities. And the reason they're doing this is, you know, th this technology that underlies uh, OpenAI, you know, ChatGPT. Um, Dolly, which is their image uh, system, it's it's built on these so-called transformers, um, which is a big revolution in artificial intelligence. But they didn't invent that. That was invented by Google, Google Brain, uh, which open sourced it a number of years ago. I think it was 2021. Um, and so what, to, back to your original question, what does GPT stand for? It's this um, general, uh, sorry, uh, generative pre-trained transformer. Um, so they basically taken this technology and used and trained it on this massive amount of information. Uh, some people say it's basically, you know, the, the whole internet. Um, and so, you know, they're, if they don't do this, if they don't keep pushing it forward, they're sort of at risk of being, um, sort of, you know, obsolete pretty quickly as competitors like Google, like Facebook and other, you know, smaller companies like Anthropic are sort of like working on, uh, new, new versions of, of all of this. So is every iteration of GPT just now we've sort of made, so to speak, if, if we can imagine GPT is this kind of, uh, uh, it's a, oh goodness, it's a Kirby or it's a Pac-Man and it goes around and it eats all the things on the internet. Is it just that each new version of GPT is a bigger Pac-Man or Ms. Pac-Man? And so then it can store the latest bit of information or are there other changes that are taking place as well, more so than just gobbling up the new stuff that's on the internet? It's definitely more than just gobbling up new stuff. I mean, it is okay. that and it, it is getting bigger. And in part, the bigger part um, and the faster part, it is faster, is is has to do with like innovations on the server side, which is the boring part of this that nobody really wants to talk about. But but Microsoft and OpenAI, Microsoft is this big investor uh, in OpenAI. We we broke the story that they're uh, going to invest about ten billion dollars uh, into into OpenAI. Um, they partnered a few years ago. They they built this supercomputer with like 280,000 uh, GPUs um, to try to, to crunch all this data. So that's another big advantage they have. There's only a handful of companies that have servers that are that big and that powerful that they can actually do this for like mass the masses. Um, and but it's not just that, right? So by releasing this to the public. OpenAI is now getting a flood of new data. Every person who uses that is, in essence, training the model. 
um, you can actually rate uh, your conversation with like a thumbs up or a thumbs down. And you can write, you know, what the answer should have been. I don't know how many people are actually doing that, but, but that helps. And also just by asking it questions and follow up questions, um, it starts to, to learn and get better. So I think it's, it's not just more, it's also, it's better, more detailed, more precise. Mm, yeah. The, and the speed is one thing that you talk about. Um, I, you know, I, have gone obviously to chat GPT and uh, a lot of times it's not available because it's at its peak hours. And uh, when you do ask it a question, it spins and spins and spins Um, with, I have to say, although it does seem kind of boring on the face of it and it's not stuff that people are paying attention to when you start to read about uh, the system that's behind actually making this a possibility, it does get pretty interesting pretty fast if you're, you know, at all kind of into geeky internet uh, technologies because you've got these huge uh, supercomputers that are having to to run this system. And I don't think that on the front of it, people on the face of it, rather people think about that, um, that part of it. Now, we... Um, we saw Microsoft make this kind of investment into the company and say, hey, look, um, we are are wanting to uh, potentially make a make some money off of this investment. But the big thing that was kind of sitting in the background at the time was Microsoft may try to work in some of uh, what OpenAI provided into its products. And it was kind of like, oh, is Clippy merging with ChatGPT? But the bigger conversation seems to surround search engines. And this could be internet shattering, right? Because Google has typically been the company that uh, we all go to for for search. So what is it about um, artificial intelligence that could make a difference in search to the point that um, I never thought I never thought in my life I'd be telling people to Bing it instead of Google it. Why would I maybe want to do that in the future? Yeah, I mean, Google definitely has this technology. Um, they're they're they have probably. I mean, I haven't seen it, um, but I've heard. I mean, it's it's maybe even more advanced than what OpenAI has. But I think they have sort of this problem, which is that they, you know, it it costs something like a couple cents every time someone does one of these mm-hmm. queries. So to just launch this and and incorporate it into Google products, which have billions of users. Um, every day, I think it would just it would just be prohibitively expensive. So they have to sort of figure out um, how do they do that. I mean, it's also kind of risky because who knows what the answers will be and what kind of abuse people will sort of uh, try to create when they use mm-hmm. this, and that could sort of embarrass Google. Uh, Microsoft has been working on incorporating this, and I think they have maybe a little bit of a head start in thinking these through these things through because they have they have been working with open ai for so long and obviously thinking about this but pretty soon they are planning on incorporating it into into bing and i don't know exactly what that's going to look like um we may we may you know see that fairly soon but um you know internet search hasn't really evolved that much i mean certainly in the in behind the scenes, you know, it get, it gets better all the time, um, but really, it's just Google and and what I've noticed with Google over time is it's just more and more ads. Um, I think it's really exciting that Microsoft has been working on something that could actually kind of kickstart a new competition in in search engines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's again the the fact that there is even a change there is is quite big. Now, uh, another story that you wrote recently that, that sort of serves as uh, more about ChatGPT is how OpenAI has um, hired a bunch of contractors. Um, can you talk about what's involved with uh, hiring these contractors, why OpenAI would be after this and, and what it could mean for the future of ChatGPT and other technologies that OpenAI provides? Yeah. So what I thought was interesting, I mean, over the past six months, they've hired around a thousand um, contractors around the world. And that's nothing really new. I mean, AI companies all the time hire contractors to do labeling. What's really fascinating about this, though, is about 40% of them, so roughly 400, are computer programmers. And normally, you don't need computer programmers to do labeling, right? You just need people to who know 
you know, what an orange looks like or something, you know, and they could say, okay, tell the computer, this is an orange and the computer learns. Um, But because OpenAI has a product where they're actually, um, this is actually incorporated in um, GitHub, this co-pilot thing where it will sort of auto-complete uh, auto complete your your computer code for you and sort of speed up the process of writing code. It's been really popular with coders and really helpful. Um, but they're sort of they're trying to take that to this new level where entire parts of sort of the the sort of um, more grunt work, if you will, um, in in writing code will be completely automated. So they have these these coders now who are you know sitting in all over the world in front of their computers. And they're being asked to sort of complete coding tasks and then explain, you know, why they did what they did. And the idea is like, by doing that, eventually down the road, you could write computer software just just by describing it. And to me, that's one of the most exciting use cases. And there's several um, that I've sort of thought about, but just the ability for a non-technical person to dream something up and then describe it and have it be created by a computer um, is really kind of like that could be really transformative, I think. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's the stuff I used to sit and think about. You know, you just you just tell it what you want and it actually can do it. That is the future I would love to see, uh, for sure. Now, uh, you know, we, we talked about uh, a little bit about these uh, on the show. Uh, I, I mentioned that some of the contractors um, were, you know, receiving low pay uh, for for labeling of uh, certain content. There was a time uh, piece all about that. Um, so that leads me to wanting to talk about the image side of things, uh, because, you know, on one side, we've got chat GPT, this bot that eventually, um, as you mentioned, will have an app uh, where you can also use these features. But Tell us about what could uh, be in the future for Doll E, the image generation platform that takes things to the next level. Yeah, totally. Um, so the content moderation uh, story that Time ran is a little bit, just to be clear, like a little different than the, what the programmers are doing, which is like labeling um, how to code stuff. Those contractors uh, who were in Africa, and I'm forgetting which specific country right now, um, I, were yeah. low pay, but I. Th- what was what was that? Oh, I said I, I am as well. I I can't remember. Oh it's yeah, in my head. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they were paid low, but I think like the the point of that was more that they were sort of traumatized by reading um, and maybe even watching uh, you know images that were sort of like graphic and 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 horrifying. Um, I think you know, sorry, my earpiece is like falling out, um, but I I think that. Um, with Dolly, this was another story that we we broke actually. Um, that Dolly actually gets run through an external company every time an image shows up. It first sort of goes through this automated process that's that's outside OpenAI um, wow. that actually screens it for uh, potential you know graphic images and things that they don't they don't want to show. Um, so there, I, I think there are real. Um, there, there are real challenges, right? With, with sort of making sure that as the, like the, the source material, the data sets are just so vast and there's so much stuff out there that screening out like, you know, offensive content is, is a real challenge. Um, and, and I think it's telling that the, that they have to use an outside company for Dolly because it kind of shows you like the parameters with which all this new AI has to exist. Like it's not good for everything. I mean, it's amazing at drawing from vast data sets, but like getting really specific answers that are correct, which is what's required for that type of content moderation. It still kind of needs to be trained by humans or, um, you know, uses a, like an older machine learning, deep learning, which of course is rel- still relatively new and revolutionary in itself. But it uses more of those types of techniques rather than the large language models or transformers that that we've seen in the, the newer stuff. Understood. Um, is there anything else uh, with the upcoming uh, chat GPT, or excuse me, I keep wanting to say that, GPT-4, uh, anything else that you'd like to share with us that you have uh, discovered thus far? Um, and is there any estimate on when this rollout is uh, set to take place? Well, I I think it's definitely very soon. 
Um, like I, I thought maybe even this week, but I don't think that's going to happen now. Um, but who knows? I mean, behind, I think it's shifted a little bit, but definitely in the coming weeks. Um, I think it's, you know, I think, I think we've touched on everything I've heard about sort of what, what is new about it. It's faster. It's more detailed, more human sounding. They've got, uh, the, um, the app coming out. I think, Oh, there is one thing about Dolly that I didn't mention, which is that they are working and I don't know when this will come out, but they are open AI is working on a way to create video with Dolly. And that's mm-hmm. something that you can already kind of do with um, stable diffusion. We've done some of that at semaphore actually our, our video team has done some really amazing stuff with that. Um, but that's, that's a new capability that I think we might see down the road with, uh, with Dolly. Interesting. Well, Reed Albergati, I want to thank you so much for your time today. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Of course, folks can head to semaphore.com to check out your uh, work. That's S-E-M-A-F-O-R.com. Uh, but if they want to follow you online, is there a good place they can go to do that? Yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter still uh, at my name, at Reed Albergati, and uh, could always use more followers. So, you know, follow <laughs> me. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was fun. Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. 